Okay. Okay, yeah, um, Ernie did mention that, I uh, see that you guys got the packs of notes uh, that we separated. If, they, if, you, if you don't have them and you want to get them, they're up there, feel free to walk up and get them. Um, raise your hand, I'll bring them to Or Richie can bring them to you. Um, if after the service, there's more packets of them that are set, not put together in a packet, you can get up there. And there is some, like Ernie said, there's some literature up there that I brought. Uh, Kind of, I cleaned out what I had at the house. Uh, if, if you run out, I'm sorry, but there's some great stuff indeed. Daily bread, you know, all that great devotional stuff, and some books and stuff. So if someone speaks to your heart, please take it. It's free. Uh, and well, here we are at Kurtz. It was a surprise to me when I heard that. Uh, but there's no fears because God's got this, right? Amen. Amen. Even if the church building fell to the ground. Right now, we know that the church is not bricks, it's not steel, it's the fellowship of believers that come together, and wherever that may be, that's the church, amen? amen. Okay, so let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, in a universe that seems so immense, it's easy to feel insignificant. Yet we know that we are precious in your sight, Father. We're unique individuals, loved and blessed in so many ways. We stand in awe of the one who has created all things and dedicate this time and all of our days to your service. Accept this offering, we pray, our sacrifice of praise and worship. We come before you, Father, a broken people, and pray your mercy upon us. We fall short of your glory over and over. Rain your mercy down upon us, please, this day, and accept our apologies. Please, O Lord of ancient of days, forgive us our transgressions. And Lord, we thank you for the warmer weather. It's been quite cold out there, uh, but we thank you for the cold because we can feel our fallen world, seasons of the fallen world. We know by these seasons that we're alive. The busyness, the pain, the trials, uh, the, the love, the hurt, the emotions, the ups and downs, the church furnace malfunctions, uh, they're all proof that we're alive and a reminder that we have the opportunity to live in you until we are with you. We must just trust you. Please give us that strength, Father, for us to trust you. We come before you, Lord, as good people, as not good people, but as your people. We ask that you instill in us an understanding and an ability to apply your message to our lives today as we continue to grow in the kingdom, men and women, after your own heart that you have predestined and created us to be. Help us to remember, leaving here today, it's not about us, Lord. It's all about you. Now, Lord, I pray for the one who teaches. My sins are so many, Father. I'm so sorry that I fall short of your glory. Please use me today for your glory. We've come to this place to see your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. And all of God's children say, Amen. Amen. Okay, so here we are. It's a, it's a new year. Uh, so I want to start this year off with basics. Okay. Uh, today's sermon is titled, Let's Get Back to Basics. Now, many with that introductory statement would probably go into uh, an eloquent uh, presentation of the gospel, or sometimes not very eloquent, uh, but that would be okay if someone were to present Jesus Christ's gospel. From the looks of it, though, we have mostly members here, from what I can see. Uh, we don't have any new unbelievers or anything. And the presentation of the gospel... It's okay a couple times a year to really give the full gospel because sometimes we have heart issues that hinder our lives. And we need Christ's gospel to cut through that, don't we? We need it to break our hearts for what broke him. But we're going to save that uh, since we have obviously more mature members here. We're going to save that until maybe later in the year when you guys are experiencing growth with your new pastor and maybe you have some new unbelievers or people that need, uh, you know, uh, s s s some heart issues to cut through, then we'll save it for them, okay? Uh, this week, uh, we're going to focus on church health. And 
one of the big uh, things that I've noticed just in the week that I've been here and talking to the people, one thing I've noticed here, there are, there's probably a lot of different areas of growth that you need uh, work with, and that's okay. That's okay. One of the big areas is growth itself in a church. Uh, and I'll get into that. I know sometimes when uh, we have a smaller church, people are very protective of their church flock, and you speak about growth, and it becomes a little bit, oh, you know, maybe <coughs> almost defensive. You know? We're going to get into that a little bit. But these other needs that I see, they're okay because life is a process. It's sanctification. That's what life is. It's okay to have needs and to work with them and, and grow with them and change with them. Amen? Uh, and growth comes from focus on health, church health. If one is malnourished and unhealthy, are they going to grow? Okay. And now keep in mind, as I say words like malnourished and unhealthy, I by no means apply them to you folks. Uh, I just want you to hear the overall message because there's a, there's a jewel in the message. And if you hear the jewel, that's what, that's what you need to apply to your own minds. Uh, and the growth uh, that I'm talking about, it also applies to a church which is alive, as our own bodies are. Yeah, I understand your departed pastor, he led you into some significant growth over the years. Uh, and that obviously means he was doing something right. Okay? And uh, <clears throat> I want to speak to you about some important things that you should discuss with the new pastor. Uh, that you can decide on so that you can continue to experience that growth that God wants for us uh, through a continued focus on healthy choices. We'll discuss the five most important areas a church should be focused on to bring steady growth individually and as a church overall. If you keep this focus, your growth will come over the next couple of years and it will be significant. It'll come, it'll, it'll, it'll continue in plateaus and valleys as any process does. There's always going to be ups and downs. But I truly feel that this is a blessed church and that the Lord is pleased with uh, Mark Lewisburg Union Church. Uh, otherwise, you would be a dying or dead church. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> believe me, I've spoken in quite a few dead churches, and I know one when I see one. And uh, this is not one. Uh, there's no hope in these churches. It's like they've lost their lampstand. And if you know what a lampstand is, you know it's an eschatological reference to the book of Revelation. It means that that church is out of God's favor. It means they're dead. It's death. They're done. Okay? And I feel the Lord is telling me that if you obey him and make the right decisions with your leadership choices and are willing to do whatever it takes to make the changes, you will, you will experience true growth in your church, not just in quantity, but also in quality. Uh, in January, I've always deemed it a month of basics. And uh, whenever I'm preaching or teaching, it's usually on a subject of fund fundamentals. Okay, so we started the basics lesson last time. It was know, grow, and heal and move forward, right? And uh, we know that Christ and his gospel are the center of our faith, uh, which is the catalyst for everything else in our life. So that said, today's basic lesson is going to be on creating a healthy church atmosphere. And there may be some change required in that, in an overall picture. And again, I'm saying that's okay. I know change isn't, a, it's not a word that people like. They don't like to hear that. Uh, it's scary, and I completely understand. Uh, comfort, the thing is comfort. Because a lot of people, they like comfort, of the comfort of it. If it's not, if it's not broke, don't <laughs> fix it, basically, right? Uh, but comfort comes through the peace and the shalom of truth. Life is a journey. All along the way, we reach points where we have to decide if we're going to step out in faith and let God take our lives to a different place or if we're going to let fear and insecurity paralyze us and keep us from crossing over. And I want you to think about uh, the story of Joshua. Is everybody familiar with that story where he led the people into Israel after Moses? Well, he was a leader appointed by God after Moses. And he had this, this, this determination, this unwavering determination. And uh, he, he was doing this to win the land that God had promised to his people. And in getting all the tribes of Israel and their families settled, a better place, a place unimaginable from where they had came. And the only way to get to the other side of life's challenges is to embrace change. Step out in faith and cross over. 
just like Joshua did and the Israelites did. Like any crossing, it's going to take strength and courage. You guys are at a transitional point in your church history right now. This is a time, an exciting time, a scary time. It's a time that you are going to either embrace change or move forward with certain things. And it's going, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be great. It's going to, be, it's going to cause growth. It's, it's going to be frightening. So it's, it's a turbulent time. Okay, so that said, let's take a look a moment at the church itself. Who founded the church? Who founded it? Jesus. Amen. Jesus Christ. So let's look at Jesus Christ. Uh, so let's identify who this person is. He was born in an obscure village. He was a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop. Uh, he uh, worked until he was 30. He worked there. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He never went to a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from his hometown. Uh, he, did, he did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33. His friends ran away. One denied him. Uh, he was turned over to his enemies, and he went through the mockery of a trial. Uh, he was nailed to a cross between two thieves. Uh, while he was dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave to the pity of a friend. Sounds pretty pitiful, doesn't it? Uh, well, 20 centuries have come and gone, and today Jesus is the central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as much as Jesus' life did, as powerfully as that one solitary life. And the greatest man in history, Jesus Christ, founded this church. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicine, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He had uh, no military battles, yet what did he do? He conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives today. So let's consider the book. Now that we know the founder, let's consider the book, the Bible. So we follow, and this is what is we follow as the authority that Christ set in the church. Consider the fact that the Bible is comprised of 66 books. Okay? It's written over a period of 1,500 years by over 40 authors from all walks of life with different kinds of personalities. And in, uh, in all sorts of situations, it was written in three languages and over on three continents, and it covers hundreds of controversial subjects. Yet it fits together into one cohesive story with an appropriate beginning, a logical ending, a central character, and a consistent theme. Okay. So how does one begin to explain such historical structure and such prophetic, doctrinal, doctrinal and spiritual congruency and harmony? How? Because of the author. The author was divine. So here's what we've done just now. You're like, well, I know all this stuff. Okay, Pastor Dave, whatever. <clears throat> well, what we've established here is that we know the power of the church by the authority of its founder okay? and the word that he gave us to follow. We see through these facts a couple things. One is that God is a God of parallel truths, not contradiction, but parallel truths, things that seem opposite of each other but are both truthful. Okay? Uh, not, uh, and that consistency and change Consistency and change, two separate truths, that they are actually parallel truths in getting the church to become the church. And that's the church become the church, you know, little church, big church. Okay? We also can see that the church is meant to be enduring and to have longevity and to be always growing and never stagnant. Okay? The church is the key in our learning of God's word and where we are taught all the biblical principles of relationships with others, family, work life, etc. So you see how important the church is, obviously. I'm sure you all figured that out by now over the years. Uh, <clears throat> the church needs to be a healthy place. Here's what we're getting to. It needs to be a healthy place where people can come to know, grow, and heal and move forward. The church is a place to embrace that and learn how to make our vertical justification into a horizontal walk, which we call what? Sanctification. Okay. And it's not about religion. It's about relationship. The, 
It's not about ceremonies. It's not about robotic monotone church creeds. Uh, it, it's much, much more. It's about grasping the five principles that serve as a model of reaching the lost world. Christ came and set up the greatest thing ever to be set up on this planet in the entire history of mankind, the church. He didn't set it up so we could have social clubs or to somehow glorifying ourselves by appearing holy or righteous. So that said, let's look at the five building blocks just real shortly. But let's start with, where my Bible? Let's start with God's Word. I have the verse written right on your sheet there so you don't have to open your Bibles. Uh, it's in Acts 42. Acts 2, verse 42 to 47. They, this is called the fellowship of the believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as they had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and are together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So in that verse, though you may not see it right off from a glance, as you study that this week, I want you to reflect on these five principles. In that passage, we have seen uh, the concepts of worship, or uh, fellowship, discipleship, serving, and evangelism. These are the five principles, when used correctly, will bring a flourishing growth to a church and will bring them health and unity and, and harmony in the church. So, and where some churches, they may already have harmony. They may already have unity, uh, but they lack in other areas. They lack in growth or, or whatever ministries that could be causing growth, not even in just in their church, but in the community. If you have strength in four areas, but not one other area, you're not fully living. You're not fully living the church life. In worship, you bring God glory by getting to know and love him. And this is your number one responsibility on earth. It's more than just raising hands on Sunday morning, guys. More than that. God wants us to enjoy and love him daily and, and give ourselves to be used for his purpose. Fellowship. You bring God glory by loving other people in his family, right? Uh, it's not just about believing, but it's also about belonging. Before you enter eternity, God wants you to learn how to love him, right? Discipleship. This is a big one. This is so important. That's why I put all that material over there. Discipleship is, is one of the most important aspects of church health. You bring God glory by becoming like Christ. He gives you a new life through a new spirit, but the rest of your life, uh, he wants you to dedicate to continuing to change your character. And why, why does he want to change our character? Because he doesn't want us to look like ourselves completely, does he? He wants us to look like Jesus Christ, doesn't he? Uh, and the only way we can do that is to grow in his word. Serving. In heaven, we will spend an eternity serving God, won't we? Uh, here we, we get lots of practice in. We practice getting good at it. And uh, it also develops our character. Plus, we are helping others reach their purpose that God has for them by helping them through our love for them. And that's called ministry. Service is ministry. Okay? And the last one was evangelism. And this is reaching out uh, to others to bring them into the family. It's caring enough about other people to tell them about the cure for death. That's life, right? And these are the biblical platform on which you can begin to see things happen in the church and the community around the church of the likes you haven't seen in a long time. I'm talking about a revival, folks. Even if your church burned to the ground today and... I assure you that when church is done right, you could start with nothing but this room. Nothing but this room. And in two or three years, you could have a church of 300, 400 people flourishing. And uh, again, I know it's not all about the numbers, but it's about the growth. And it can start with nothing and in a couple of years be huge because of what you're doing for your community. And the, I guess the, these, points, these points are real short, but they're real powerful. Okay? First one is we have to love people the way Jesus did. 
That is number one most important thing. I believe this is the most overlooked principle for church growth. And I'm known for saying that pastors need to be lo more lost oriented. Uh, uh, they, they need to be uh, looking at their church from the perspective of someone who's an unbeliever. And if, I'll elaborate just slightly on that. The reason Jesus attracted such large crowds and he had this, Jesus had a mega church. They had tens of thousands of people following him in the wilderness. They come out to see him speak. And why do you think that is? Because he loved them. He loved them. He cared about them. You know, some churches I've heard, I've been in real tiny churches, uh, that have told me, we're small because we don't water down the gospel. Well, we know, that's not the truth. That, that has nothing to do with anything. Maybe the real reason is they don't have a crowd is because they don't want a crowd. You know, they, they, they love their own comfort more than they love the lost people. To reach unbelievers, you have to move outside your comfort zone and do things that often feel awkward and uncomfortable to you. It takes unselfish people to grow a church. And lost people have a lot of problems. Their lives, they're messy. See, I don't think it was an accident. I don't, I don't know about you, but when Jesus said, when he, uh, he had this analogy that uh, reaching Christians was like being a fisherman, right? Uh, fishing, fishing is often messy and it's smelly. And too many times, churches want their fish, they want them, they want them uh, cleaned, cut, gutted, pre-scaled, and handed to them on a silver platter. Okay? And that's the reason they never reach anyone. If your church is serious about reaching the unchurched, you're going to have to be definitely willing to put up with people's messy lives. Because that's what the world's all about. The secret of reaching unbelievers is learning to think like an unbeliever. But the problem is, the longer that we're Christians the more we think like Christians. It's difficult. Paul says, I become all things to all men. And what he means by this is not that he goes out and drinks in bars with them and hangs out with them and does it, but that he targets, you know, he, he targets his audience based on who they are. If he's, in, if he's a Jew, he speaks with, the, speaks with the Jews like a Jew. He speaks with the Gentiles like a Gentile. If he were in Southwestern PA, I'm sure he'd say things like yins and ain't it and different comments that we, he would talk like a Southwestern PA guy, you know? Uh, some people think that, though, that that's a fake thing. They think that communicating like that is like being a chameleon. But uh, I believe that it means you're strategic. You have to look at the culture around you and you have to fit in with the culture but you don't compromise the message. That's a very important. The methods of sharing have to change with every new generation and location. The programs and tools that we use maybe for an inner city pastor as compared to a missionary in Japan, as compared to a mountain church in Markleysburg, they're gonna be different tools, but they're gonna be based on the same foundation, okay? So here we are at point two. There is no one way to grow a church, but you need a healthy foundation to keep any kind of growth stable. After we grasp the essentiality of the need for love, we can use that to embrace the five principles. Okay? They're biblical and they work. I've seen them. Hundreds of churches. Well, I've been in hundreds of churches, but lots of churches and, and the studies I've done of hundreds. Of, these five principles work. And they bring unity and stability. They are, they're sort of like the bones and tendons of, of God's church that hold it together. It, and it takes all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. So don't think that I'm looking for some sort of uh, uniform, one world church. It's not like that. It's just you need a general template to get that, to get that health increase. Uh, <clears throat> if you're getting the job done, though, and lives are being changed, you're on the right track. And I think you guys are. I really do. I think you're on a great track. You guys really seem to make a difference. You know? These principles are just about refinement. They're about bringing new life, new strength into the, into the health of the church experience. Every church, though, has to have its own unique thumbprint, right? If a principle is biblical, I believe that it's transcultural. Uh, in other words, it will work anywhere, but you must filter through those principles through the culture of your own community and the makeup of the congregation and the personality of the pastor. And this is where the five principles that we're discussing come into play. Churches driven by purpose are all committed to these New Testament purposes of the church, but these congregations come in all sizes. 
Okay? It's, like I said, it's not always about the quantity. The quantity just comes. It comes with, as you focus on church health, growth comes automatically. It's just the way it is, as you guys have experienced over the last few years. Uh, <clears throat> God's purposes for the church, they, they never change. But the programs do change, and they have to. Uh, and that brings us to point three. Prayer and dedication are not enough for a church to be healthy. I know there's prayer warriors in there that are like, whoa. You know, I mean, prayer is the answer to everything. I believe prayer is a wonderful, it's, it's needed. We need it. This is how we communicate with God. This is how he knows our hearts, and, and he can work with us. Okay, but it's not going to hold a church together completely. Uh, I want to submit to you that it's absolutely a myth uh, that all you need is prayer and dedication to grow a healthy church. Some of the most dedicated prayer warriors that I know have been pastors of dying churches and churches that they've lost due to death of the church. We've all heard uh, speakers claim that if you'll just pray more, have faith. Preach the word. You know, you hear Joel Osteen on there. Just have faith and you'll be rich and wealthy and prosperous. But this isn't true. It's not true. I can show you thousands of churches where pastors are doctrinally sound. Okay? And they love the Lord. They're committed. They're spirit filled. And yet their churches, just they don't grow. And 99% of our churches would be growing today if this were the case. If it was about dedication, I can tell you every person in this room is probably completely dedicated to this church. You know? And churches all around the world. It doesn't mean the growth is going to happen. Growing a healthy church is not easy. It's not simple. It involves different factors, and it requires a lot of different leadership skills in the church. It's not all the pastors. There's a lot of leaders in the church that, that make up uh, the health of a church. So that's very important to know. Anytime you hear a person say that there is only one way to growth, they're lying to you from the pits of hell. And you run, put your tennis shoes on and run from them as far as you can because they're, they're, they're lying, just like their father said. And that's why I'm convinced that the key issue uh, for congregations in the 21st century is church health, not church growth. Like I said, growth will come with health. All living things grow if they're healthy. Do you have to tell your kids to grow? <laughs> Are they healthy? They're well fed, you know? I mean, they, they're taken to the doctors. You don't have to tell them to grow. They grow on their own. And uh, that's because... The body, the human body, it's got a lot of different systems, right? It's got the respiratory system, the muscular system, the central nervous system, the, uh, what else, digestive system, whatever. When these systems are in complete, they call it homeostasis. When they're in complete balance, then that's called health. But when they're not in balance, what's it called? Disease, okay? Likewise, the body of the uh, Christ, the church, is made up of different systems, each fulfilling uh, a, a different purpose. You know, we have the worship, the fellowship, the evangelism, the discipleship, and the ministry. These are the digestive and respiratory and central nervous systems of the church. The things I'm giving you are the organs of the church. Okay? The church is a living entity. The Bible is a living book. It's alive. You know? And <clears throat> when you have a healthy system or process for each of these purposes, these systems are balanced and the church naturally grows. But here's the catch. Unless you set up an intentional strategy and structure to ensure balance between the five purposes, then your church will tend to overemphasize in certain, certain areas. So if you have a pastor that's most passionate about, say, evangelism, okay, the church may reach lots of people, but nobody grows up in their faith, right? If he has a gift of teaching, the church will develop mature believers but will tend to neglect within their communities, reaching the lost. Uh, if he has pastoral gifts, the church will have great fellowship and care. Okay? And the church's ministry to the community is going to suffer instead. Or there's going to be little evangelism. You must set up a structure that's driven by purpose and allows the church to become more than just an extension of its pastor. Every church is driven by something. It's driven by tradition. Driven by programs, it's driven by finances, events, seekers, uh, buildings. You know, these five purposes outlined in Acts are 
just a, basically a template for purpose. A church has to be driven by purpose. 